Good morning and welcome. My name is Gina Longo and I'm Gamma's Director of Communications. Welcome to the 2013 Annual Industry Review. <clears throat> this morning we're going to have two speakers. We're going to have Brad Matier, Gamma's new chairman. We're also going to have Pete Bunce, President and CEO of Gamma. This press conference, as some of you may know, is uh, live webcasted. Uh, it'll be available for viewing on our website and it'll be archived later for viewing as well. We'll take Q&As at the end. Uh, if you can, please wait for a microphone and then ask your question into the microphone so that we can get it as part of the webcast. Uh, in addition, if you're looking for a press packet with a, a statistical data book, those will also be available as you exit. If you need any more information, please contact me and I'm happy to give you my business card. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the General Aviation Manufacturers Association Annual State of the Industry Briefing. As Gina said, I'm Brad Mottier, Vice President and General Manager of the Business and General Aviation Division for GE Aviation. But today I'm here as a Chairman of the Board of Gamma, and I'm joined, obviously, by Pete Bunce, who's the President of Gamma. Serving as the Chairman of Gamma is an honor for me. I've been involved in general aviation as long as I can remember. I grew up in aviation in a flying family. My parents bought their first airplane before they bought their first house, actually before they even had their pilot's licenses. They wanted to live their life together on a broad scale, not defined by roads and speed limits or someone else's schedule. Having both served in the U.S. military during World War II, they were intent on making up lost time and general aviation was the perfect vehicle. The freedom and efficiency of general aviation provided my parents and made their lives richer and more fulfilled and helped connect communities not served by scheduled air travel by providing access to critical services and helping expand our economy. These same attributes continue today in general aviation, but now on a global scale. I've been fortunate to have made my, li my living in aviation, starting right out of graduate school working for a small company where I designed magneto ignition systems. Five years ago, I launched GE's Business and General Aviation Organization, and it was really a homecoming for me to get back into general aviation. So being here today with Gamma for their annual update is really a privilege. This morning, we will briefly review 2012 data for our industry, but we're really here, and what I really want to talk about, and Pete does too, is what lies ahead in 2013 and beyond. Gamma consists of nine committees, including a committee on the environment, flight operations policies, international affairs, technical policies, to name just a few. And these committees are led by high-profile, influential leaders who work at Gamma member companies. Gamma has a big agenda for 2013, which you can find in the data book and in your press packets. This agenda will be driven by the Gamma committees and their leaders. We want to unlock the potential and opportunities of general aviation worldwide to help accelerate growth of the industry and create jobs around the world. I'd like to also extend to you my welcome. It's just a privilege to have Brad up here on the stage with me. I, I get the honor each year of having a, a new chairman, uh, and each one has brought their special brand and, and flavor to this association. And Brad's starting off the year strong, and we're having our, our board meeting this afternoon, and we're off and running. But from our founding back in 1970, this association has been focused on really one thing. And when you think about, when I look at the founders board meeting for Gamma and see some of the iconic faces in general aviation manufacturing, it's truly awesome to be able to be part of this association. But that focus has always been on safety. And that's getting safety enhancing technologies into the cockpit for use by our customers. And now we're an association of over 80 worldwide manufacturers, trainers, maintenance and repair, organizations, and that list keeps growing. In fact, after today's board meeting, I'm sure you'll see a press release on adding a few more. But that focus is truly international. 
Our involvement has been with international organizations. We have offices in Europe, and in 2012, we started our formal presence in China with an office opening in Beijing. And we've already garnered the fruits of that investment uh, for many of our manufacturers that are working on delivering aircraft into that important country. These efforts, all of these, are the result of a board that's truly phenomenal. Each and every one of our member companies has a seat on the board. Big company, small company, they're all there. And they've given tremendous support to me and my staff, and I'm very proud of the fact that I think that I have an assembly of the most technically minded and best technical experts in the whole field that are able to work these issues on a global basis. So it's a true honor to be able to be up here today with my chairman. Gamma is growing. In 2013, we're seeing a renewed enthusiasm for general aviation. We're focused on the vast possibilities and development that is taking place is an example of how our industry, despite obstacles, soars ahead. The 2012 shipments, frankly, were a little mixed, and we'll review those coming up. But don't let the numbers fool you. More than 20 new fixed-wing aircraft and helicopters are in development at Gamma, Gamma Companies. These companies in, include where I work at GE and all the others. We're investing billions of dollars to create new, more efficient, and safer products and designed for the global customer and the global market. When these products are introduced in the next three to five years, we'll see the numbers change substantially. In every segment, whether it's piston where we have jet A powered aircraft, turboprops that are faster, more fuel efficient, rotorcraft with compound helicopters, new jets in every category, and all the systems and components that are manufactured by, within the industry to support those aircraft, we're growing. And so Gamma has expanded to become a more global organization. The organization has also expanded its membership to encompass two new significant segments, agricultural aviation and rotorcraft. And I'd like to acknowledge several new member companies who are with us today. One is Thrush Aircraft Payne Hughes. Uh, he's the president of Thrush. And Mark Paganini, the president and CEO of American Eurocopter. I hope you have a chance to talk with them specifically uh, after the break. The expansion of Gamma will help us present an even more united front on key issues that are critical to our business. We have a big year outlined for Gamma this year with a lot of work to be done by the committees I mentioned. I feel confident that working together, we can accomplish anything. Here are some of the industry initiatives in the pipeline. We're continuing to build the global awareness about the economic impact and societal benefits of general aviation in 2013. From an economic standpoint, aviation is a significant engine for growth and has a tremendous impact in terms of jobs around the, glo around the globe. From a societal impact uh, standpoint, General aviation plays an enormous role, whether it is ag aircraft and their work protecting our food and crops, to the medical air services who transport a half a million people each year, according to the Association of Air Medical Services. These services would not be possible, would not be possible without general aviation aircraft and its members. We're focused on working with government agencies and regulators on certification regulations globally to improve safety. Many current regulations, frankly, are burdensome, they're costly, and they do not accelerate safety improvements. These regulations are also not integrated seamlessly around the world. Gamma must work with regulating agencies to simplify those processes, which will open up the industry to allow more innovation and enhance overall safety as well as allow the installation of already approved safety equipment in more aircraft. Finally, while GA has a strong culture of safety, we can do better. Gamma remains committed to working with regulators to raise safety levels of GA worldwide. Let's tell you how we plan to do some of these initiatives. Gamma is resolute in strengthening access to markets for GA globally. Since 2009, Gamma has operated an office in Brussels, and we've forged a strong spirit of cooperation between the European Aviation Safety Agency, EASA, and the FAA. 
This has helped consolidate and streamline regulatory requirements that had a positive impact on our membership, but, but we have more work to do. Ensure safe, effective safety cooperation by strengthening the U.S.-EU safety agreement and eliminating redundant activities. Advocate for improvements to European aviation regulations to conform to the European Union's 2012 safety st strategy document. We are now working to translate the progress made between the U.S. and E.U. into global markets, such as China, as Pete mentioned. We've all heard about the growth potential in China for aviation, and it's imperative that we start laying the groundwork for cooperation now. That's why Gamma has put folks on the ground in China to lead the way on these efforts. We need to continue working with the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum on a framework to facilitate business operations in the Asia-Pacific region and expand to the Middle East. Finally, we need to work with TSA here at home to improve air sport, uh, airspace and airport access for general aviation. This includes lifting temporary flight restricted zones and improving access to airports where temporary flight restrictions are in place, like here in Washington at Reagan National. Advocating for government policies that strengthen GA is of paramount importance to this association. We're promoting infrastructure development not only here in the U.S., whether we're talking about next gen, which as we all know, we're driving a lot of the control functions or the ability to be able to move aircraft around from the ground into the sky and the advanced avionics that we have, but also with SASAR in Europe and also the growing programs through our associations, uh, our sister associations in different parts of the planet that try and move their next-gen systems or their more modern air traffic control and leapfrog to satellite technology. We're also working up at ICAO in the International Civil Aviation uh, Organization to be able to develop a CO2 standard that will guide all turbine aircraft development from here on, and that's been a gamma and gamma member company-led effort. We're advocating for a regulatory environment worldwide that provides sound tax and trade policies. In fact, I had Gamma board members with us yesterday at the Department of Commerce where we were talking about trade barriers that we find for general aviation aircraft, both the importation and domestic development in several of the countries that we have, have interest in getting help to be able to solve some problems there. And we also strive for appropriate oversight and accountability through appropriate funding for aviation safety resources in each one of the countries where we're delivering aircraft. Another vital area for Gamma is raising general aviation safety levels. Well, how do we do that? One of the primary focuses that we have had over the last year is to try to look at how we are regulated and how those regulations just strangle our ability to get safety enhancing technologies into the cockpit. So that's why we have led along with partnership not only from the FAA, but regulators from over eight countries in the Part 23 rewrite initiative. But we're not going to stop there. At the HAI convention in Las Vegas in March, we're going to jump into being able to work the same lessons learned that we found in Part 23 into Part 27, because there too, we can get safety enhancing technologies into the hands of the operators and we can save lives. We're advancing the work of the FAA on public-private partnerships, such as the General Aviation, it's, it's called a GAJSC, the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee. And it followed a very successful model called CAS that we had in the commercial environment. And now we're jumping in on the rotorcraft side to be able to help also with their safety, safety systems to be able to do the analysis and the predictive analysis to be able to go ahead and figure out what's going to happen before something bad happens to operators by using different tools that we have available. One of the ways we do that is to facilitate the incorporation of flight data. And it's not just in finding out what happened in an accident. It's to be able to go ahead and provide data to operators on the maintenance or the maintainability of their aircraft, how their systems are performing, but also how they're flying those systems, whether it's a rotorcraft or fixed wing, to be able to provide them feedback so they have better predictions of, one, how they can maintain the aircraft, but two, trouble before it actually happens. 
We're engaging Chinese authorities on GA risk analysis and also to educate those regulators on how best to be able to go ahead and have a safe general aviation system in the country. And also, we're advocating for best practices on safety management, uh, and that was a big emphasis in 20, 2012 that will continue in 2013 that looks at airworthiness and operations in total, looking at the whole picture. So let's take a little closer look at the Part 23 uh, rewrite process. First of all, Gamma has been the leader in working with regulators on the Part 23 Reorganization Aviation Rulemaking Committee, or the ARC. The Part 23, these are the lighter half, the lighter side of general aviation aircraft that provide that critical access to uh, remote uh, airports that are not served by larger carriers that I talked about earlier that are so critical to uh, general aviation in our economy and communities. Current certification regulations are overly burdensome, costly, and they've slowed down the introduction of new technologies that would, that would improve the safety of general aviation. The FAA has coined the term twice the safety at half the cost. It's where we need to go, and Gamma is in full agreement. Let me give you a good example of what we mean. While the number of aviation accidents are small, a stall Aircraft stall remains one of the most common accident causes in GA and account for 40% of all fatal general aviation accidents. Warning systems like angle of attack indicators are available to alert pilots. In fact, in 1979, my master's thesis was on this very topic, the design of an angle of attack indicator for general aviation aircraft. And here we are 35 years later just getting around to figuring out how to put these into Part 23 aircraft. 35 years, that's a long time. In fact, an experimental aircraft today can have an angle of attack indicator for about $800. To have this installed in a certified aircraft is about $8,000. It's 10 times. We've got to change that. Then when you factor in the regulatory complexity, which adds timing delays, and it becomes a, a lengthy and extremely cost prohibitive process. By rewriting the regulations, the government agencies could help improve, they could help improve the overall safety of general aviation and reduce the certification cost for manufacturers, or bring the term, their term, twice the safety at half the cost to life. By reducing these costly barriers, we could open up the GA industry to more field safety embracing technologies, new models, and more operators. We also need to ensure regulations are unified around the world to standardize the certification process globally. And this is, this is very important. It's the holy grail. It's to get this done internationally. And again, Gamma is leading the way to do this. We've been honored to chair eight ARC meetings with foreign authorities, and all the countries involved have given their full support. From Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, Canada, Europe, FAA, globally the regulators are working together to fast track these regulatory changes to move us to a safer and healthier general aviation. When people hear about these efforts, the first thing they ask is, how soon can we make this happen? And we're happy to tell them we're moving in the right direction. Building global awareness about the economic impact and the contributions that GA makes to society is extremely important. We're very proud that we partner with NBAA on No Plane, No Gain, and, and one of the manufacturer's components to that is the rallies that we have around the U.S. An example right here of two rallies we hosted in 2012 with the co-chairs of the Senate GA caucus. You have Senator Begich from Alaska, and we had a very successful rally up in Anchorage with our sister associations, bringing in the whole spectrum of general aviation. And when you have a senator talking about people in his state, kids, that fly in an airplane before they ever get in a car in some of the northern reaches of Alaska, you start to realize the importance of general aviation 
to everything that happens in a state like Alaska. But then it doesn't stop there. Senator Johans from Nebraska, we had him at Duncan Aviation in Lincoln, along with Senator Nelson, looking our workers in the eye and talking about the importance of what they do there for the economy in Nebraska and also the importance that general aviation brings, not only all the hunters it brings into the state, but just the ability to grow crops there is dependent upon the ag com component of general aviation. Now we have a new Congress, so our manufacturers provide us data on their footprint, their employment footprint, not only for themselves, but for their supplier base. And with that data, we go to the Hill and we influence new members of Congress about how many folks really are, are employed in this industry. This is the first year, though, we're really going to try to stretch that and get data from areas outside of the U.S. because we are an international industry and our footprint extends well beyond the borders of the United States. And when we can go to a member of the European Parliament and be able to show our economic footprint there of this great industry, it really does make a difference. The GA caucuses are very important to us. We have to rebuild them, and our members are working with every single elected official to make sure that they have signed up and they are part of those caucuses in the House and the Senate. But we also like to highlight the very important contribution that some of our different organizations give back to society through general aviation. I just want to speak of a few of them. Gamma is very involved in the Veterans Airlift Command. Now, this group, founded in 2006, has, has surpassed over 6,500 veterans flown. And just in 2012, these missions that not only go to get, get these men and women medical care, but also get them connected back up to their units for their morale and their well-being and just their recovery from some of these just horrific uh, wounds that they have had. In 2012, we flew over 1,750 passengers and went over a million air miles. And two of our member companies have actually painted their aircraft with Veterans Airlift Command colors to be able to support that mission. And in fact, uh, Scott Ernst from uh, Cessna uses missions on these Veteran Airlift Command uh, to fly these veterans as incentive programs for his employees. And he says the f success and the excitement that each one of the employees that wins uh, monthly awards gets to be able to fly in those missions is just worth its weight in gold. Another organization that GAMMA board members and GAMMA as a whole, along with our partners at NBA, are very, very involved with is the Corporate Angel Network. And last year was a good year. Uh, over 250 patients flown per month. And remember, these are cancer patients flying on available seats on business aviation aircraft. Uh, and we flew over 3,000 total patient flights in 2012, and that brings the patient total since 1981 and the founding of this great organization to over 41,000. And they're able to do that with a small staff of six people and about 36 volunteers. Truly phenomenal results that, that we get and a great organization giving back. We're very involved in STEM education. We have a lot of programs and we're all concerned about pilot production and the diminishing number of pilots that we have out there. But this association, in addition to being concerned about pilots, is concerned about our workforce. We've got, to, we've got to build the engineers and the mechanics of tomorrow that will be able to man those aircraft and provide those aircraft to the pilots that we hope to build. So we have partnered for the last five years with a great organization called Build-A-Plane. And I have Katrina Bradshaw here today who, who's uh, the assistant director of this wonderful organization. And we take older aircraft and we're able to place them into high schools around the country and allow kids to get their hands dirty, to use it in industrial arts, but more importantly, to allow teachers to build STEM education all around that aircraft. So we're so excited about this program, we're announcing a, a great initiative today. We're going to have a design build competition here in 2013. And there'll be a, a press announcement made very shortly that'll go out to high schools throughout this country that provides them free software from a program that's called Fly to Learn. And in, it basically is using STEM and showing teachers how they can use 
aviation and all the science that's involved in aviation to develop and cultivate STEM education. It gives these teachers a capability to show them how to use the software, but then it gets it in the hands of the kids, and the kids get to virtually design aircraft. And then they get to have a competition and virtually fly them off. And this program is very sophisticated. It records all the design parameters so that we're able to go and capture that. Each team then will go and send in one entrant, and we will have Gamma member company engineers evaluate those with a winning team selected that will get an expen all expense paid trip up to Arlington, Washington starting on June 17th to be able to actually go build an aircraft. They're going to build a Sportsman 2 plus 2 at Glass Air up in Washington and our hope is after that two week period as, these, as the winning team builds it that we're going to be able to get it test flown to meet all the FAA parameters of flying it locally before we can take it out of the local area, get it to paint and then get it to Oshkosh and invite that winning team to be with us for an award ceremony and also the Young Eagle gathering up at Oshkosh. So we're very excited about this initiative. Another organization that I'm very excited about is a grassroots organization called the Recreational Aviation Foundation. And I'm very fortunate to have John McKenna and Tim Clifford here in the audience, who's the, uh, the president and the treasurer of this organization. And what this grassroots group has been able to do in the last year. Just think about it. In 2012, they grew over a thousand, by over 1,000 members. They opened up 15 new airstrips on public lands. Now, anybody that knows how environmentally sensitive and how complicated it is and the patchwork of public lands between the, Fed, the Forest Service, the BLM, state lands, knows how, what a Herculean project that is, over 15 new airstrips. But more importantly, over, right as of today, 18 recreational use statutes in state legislatures, with the most recent one being signed by Governor Beebe in Arkansas as of yesterday. Why is that important? Recreational use status statutes allow someone who has a private airstrip to allow people to use it and have liability protection. So it's opening up more airfields throughout the country so that people can enjoy it. And somebody like Brad that's got big tires on his tail dragger can go out there and really, really enjoy those and get more people involved in this great industry. So we're, we're very proud of that association. So now let's touch on 2012 shipments and billings. Again, as Brad mentioned, a mixed bag. So let's start off on the fixed wing production. And again, these are certified production aircraft and we'll start with the pistons. If we look at 2012 and compare it to 2011, slightly down, about 2% down on shipments and commensurate a slight drop in the billings. If we go to turboprops and look at that segment, turboprops are up about 10%. Now it's important to note why or, or what element of turboprops are up. If we, as Brad mentioned, last year we started representing the ag part of our industry, very important part, and really the increase is because of ag. Now, we have backed the ag numbers into 2011, so you have an apples to apples comparison. If we took ag out of turboprops, turboprops would have been flat, but the ag community is doing great. And so you end up, if you go back just, just a second, if you look at the billings, billings are slightly down because some of our larger turboprops, where obviously the margins are bigger, had a little less deliveries back in 2012. Now let's go to jets, taking a look there, slightly down about 3.4% in 2012 over 11, and billings obviously slightly down with those as well. If you look at overall shipments, again, because of our ag brethren, uh, we are up slightly on shipments, but again, a relatively flat year. Billings, just slightly down because of the jets. Now this is the first year we're reporting on rotocraft data, and again, we're very proud to be able to start representing this very important segment of general aviation. And the way we have divided the categories will, uh, just like on the fixed wing side, three different categories. So let's take a look at pistons. This is a very bright spot of general aviation at this time. Look at that increase in pistons, over 22% increase from 2011 to 2012. 
Now let's look at single engine turbines. Again, a very healthy increase, over 23% between the two years. And now let's go to twin engine turbines. Again, a very healthy increase that we're seeing, over 16% between the two years. So if you look at overall shipments in rotorcraft, good business to be in right now. And we, in the energy sector, and with everything that is happening there, we're seeing some great development. And, and, and again, it's wonderful to be able to go and represent this segment of the industry, and our membership in that segment is growing, and obviously we have a lot of suppliers that supply to this segment. Overall billings up 21% in 2012. You know, we've talked. Uh, we've talked about Gamma becoming a more global company uh, organization, uh, representing more uh, Gamma member companies, and so we want to take a look at the shift of uh, our shipments and activities around the world. And so we looked at the global market distribution for 2012, and an interesting story began to surface. So we decided to go back a few years to uh, 2008. When you compare the global market distribution for fixed wing aircraft. From 2008 to 2012, you'll see a continued shift away from North America and a rise in shipments in emerging markets. This trend began in the jet segment, and in 2012, for the first time, shipments in all three segments, jets, turboprops, and pistons, to North America dipped to 50%. This shift signifies the more global nature of GA sales, and is reflected in our member companies which are expanding their operations globally to better manage and service their products that are, they are selling to global markets. We believe the shipment figures for North America have stabilized and won't go much past the 50% mark, but we anticipate seeing shifts in other markets as GA shipments continue to grow in emerging markets like the Asia Pacific and Latin and South America. With that, our press briefing is concluded, and now we'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. Absolutely anyone, and again, so that the folks on the webcast can hear it, we've got microphones available. If you could just uh, identify yourself and the organization you're with, we'd appreciate it. Well, you've covered 2012. What's your outlook for 2013? I'll let you start, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, as I said, we, uh, uh, 2012 was kind of mixed. We, th we see the turbo props, the ag business, is going to continue to, uh, uh, to thrive. There are more and more uh, needs for those type of uh, specialized uh, aircraft around the world. And in fact, more than 50% of the ag aircraft are actually uh, sold outside of uh, North America. So that portion of the, of the industry is going to continue to continue to do well, as is the rotorcraft. I would say, Murray, that uh, one of the wild cards that we just don't know the effects of right now is going to be the overall impact of sequestration. And in addition to that, if we have a continuing resolution through the end of the fiscal year for the federal government. Uh, we had a, a large team in with the FAA this morning, and one of the messages to us is the furloughs that will probably result will have a negative impact on, on us, uh, as it will all of, all of aviation. So this is serious business. And if, if sequestration happens, if for, for some reason this, uh, this economy is dumped in, you know, our recovery is either stalled or, or God forbid, we jump back into recession because of it, this is going to severely impact all of us. But I think it's significant to note when, when Brad was showing those numbers, 50% of the market now in pistons, turboprops, uh, on the fixed wing side, pistons, uh, turboprops, and jets in the U.S., that's not a finite pie. That's an expanding pie. And so when this economy finally does recover in North America and we see recovery in Europe, that bodes well that, that this entire industry is going to take off. And that's why I think you see all of this investment that Brad talked about. You know, these are smart, smart men and women that are running these companies, and we wouldn't be spending the billions of dollars in investment unless we saw a bright future ahead. But, the, but when is it actually going to start? I think is, is a lot of that's going to be determined by what happens in the next month or so. 
Robert Goyer with Flying. Uh, so, Pete, um, we've seen a, a theme with GAM over the past uh, many years has been including more and more segments of, uh, of aviation under the GAM umbrella as you've grown to include, well, rotorcraft now also. Uh, but I'm curious about the, um, the increasing importance with uh, unmanned systems in the, in the airspace, in the industry. I know that a lot of your member companies have involvement with unmanned systems already. And I was wondering how Gamma is planning on addressing the, uh, the growing importance and prevalence of, uh, of UAS in the national airspace system in the, in the industry. Awesome. Robert, you know, the U.S., we, we could talk hours about what's happening in, in that industry. We all know what's coming. And, and now how are we going to manage the integration of, of these aircraft into the airspace? And the, the questions are, are immense. You know, what kind of training do you have to have for people that are, that are flying them? Uh, recently, uh, I sit on uh, co-chair of the Industry Management Council to the JPDO, which is the advisory, one of the advisory groups to the FAA on, on NextGen. And we had a small UAS sitting on the table. And this thing had four little rotor blades on it. Sensor package about this big cost $30,000. Okay, so, so even the small ones aren't going to be cheap. But the question is, who's, who's going to be trained to fly them? What kind of regulations are in place? And what are the mitigating factors if, some, if one of these gets loose and, and it goes lost link? So a lot of those issues for manned aircraft are, are being worked, and fortunately we're working with the FAA on the introduction and how and the roadmap for UAS integration is supposed to be released here in, the, in just a very short time. I, it looks like the FAA is working on the small UASs first. Uh, to me, I think large UASs, especially operated by the military when they're predator size or global hawk, those are easy to see with your eyes. They already know how to do them. Controllers know where they are. That would seem to me to be the easiest road and the toughest ones are the small UASs. But the technology that we can leverage off of some of these machines is absolutely great. You know, if you have a button in your airplane all of a sudden that you could push if you got in trouble and it went auto land, especially if you're flying over at night or if you were flying over some bad weather and you just hit a button, well, that's how the UAVs are going to operate if they go lost link. They've got to get down and, and got to go somewhere. If we can leverage off that. Or how about the EMS helicopter that has to get down through some bad weather for a, for a traffic ac accident, and they can hit a button that just designs an approach for them that keeps all their obstruction criteria in place and gets them right down there safely. That's great technology that I think we all can leverage. So there, there's challenges, but there's great opportunities as we integrate these machines into the airspace. And if you look at some countries out there like Japan, they're already doing a, a lot of uh, ag applications with those uh, machines and we have a lot of pressure by a lot of commercial entities whether they're realtors or anybody else to to want to be able to get these i think the hollywood crowd petition to be able to start using them for for filming for uh, uh recently i think i read that in actually in one of your uh, publications Robert. Right? Pete, the uh, ETS situation is confused and fluid at the moment, and they're, they're waiting for action by ICAO. I'm just curious, what do you think is the time frame and the ultimate impact on business aviation in particular about ETS regs? And while we're on the subject of the environment, what happens if, uh, if, if the situation regarding leaded av fuel goes to the courts? Are you prepared to defend in court? Very com the environment's very complex, and I, I would even throw another one in there. We've had some new noise regulations up at ICAO that our member companies have been involved with over the last week, so it, it, the hits keep on coming. Uh, when you look at ETS, and I think uh, Ed and I are always talking uh, very closely on the next impact, we use our organization up there in Montreal, IBEC, to be able, we have partnered with them to be able to really take a look at this, because if we don't have some type of of resolution on a global basis, the question becomes what do the Europeans do next? You know, they gave the year reprieve. There was a clear message sent by the U.S. government as to how the U.S. government felt about the about aviation, particularly the airlines, paying into the systems that the money just goes into the coffers of the European countries. It doesn't actually go to do things like advanced SAR or single European skies or, or things that could be aviation related. So People have a, a lot of problem with the extraterritoriality about it. 
Um, what progress is being made up there, I, I think there's mixed results from what I'm hearing. I, I think that some of the countries like China are adopting some measures that are somewhat in line of market-based measures, but what actually all that will look like is, is truly a, a work in progress and something that I know Ed's very, very concerned about, and, and we are too, because right now the system that's set up for ETS disenfranchises business aviation tremendously, and, and we have to get this fixed. So we're glad that the, that the U.S. government is backing us on this, but there, there are a lot of pieces to fall into place. And obviously with change in leadership and the EPA here, the EPA is driving a lot of the train along with the FAA as our, with our position up in Montreal. On the unleaded avgas, we're again working with all our coalition partners, all, all of the GA associations. Uh, despite the economic situation that the FAA is in, uh, we have had a very nice commitment from Administrator Huerta to be able to go ahead and keep this program on track to be able to develop the test protocols, and we're doing a lot of that testing up in Atlantic City, to be able to have companies come with the, with different, different companies come in with entrance for the, the fuel. And I think it's important that the FAA has said safety's got to trump uh, the situation at this time and be able to give us time to transition. We can find that, but at the same time that we're doing that, there's also, as you notice, there's a lot of diesel, or not diesel, but, but piston jet A powered solutions coming on board also, which, which can give us some alternatives out there. And I'm very excited to see what's happening in our industry just in, in those piston jet A powered uh, power plants that are prol proliferating out there. I'm Charles Spence of General Aviation News. Uh, recently, a uh, international meeting on uh, aviation, the airlines indicated that they would need hundreds of thousands of pilots worldwide over the coming years. General aviation pilots, uh, like uh, a few people like myself, are getting to the age where we won't fly. The age level of general aviation pilots has been increasing year after year after year. About uh, roughly eight out of ten persons who start flying as pilots uh, drop out and the airlines are going to need pilots, you're going to need pilots to sell your products. What is being done to get people into aviation and to keep them there? I'll start with that one. Well, uh, some of what Gamma is working on, the uh, uh, FAR Part 23 uh, ARC work that we're doing to try to streamline and simplify the process of certification will ultimately result in a uh, lower cost of uh, producing the aircraft, certifying the aircraft, and that'll help, help on the financial side f uh, to allow more access for more people. I, we work very closely with our sister associations on that that problem of trying to identify new pilots. Now, of course, we've got concerns also, you know, where's China going to get the pilots? And that's why one of the reasons why they have a very concerted plan in their five-year plan to be able to go and develop their general aviation sector, not only to respond to uh, disaster relief, but to be able to grow their pilot population. So everyone is looking at this with great concern. So you've got programs, obviously, Young Eagles were very supportive. Uh, Gamma, uh, when you look at what AOPA is doing, they've got a good program to be able to start developing flight, uh, basically flying clubs uh, out there. But I think one of the things that we as the manufacturers are also doing, in, in addition to the Build-A-Plane project that I just announced today, is if you look at the advancements of simulator technology, we have, we have basically the cream of the crop of simulator companies in Gamma. And the ability and what we're learning on leverage off of how the military trains pilots and what we can do in simulation for some of the, the things that you cannot safely simulate while you're airborne, a lot of the emergency procedures, but also some of the, the routine tasks of just being able to fly the aircraft properly. Let's say that we were able to get, get AOA gauges in the aircraft. Where would be the best place for us to train our new generation on how to use an AOA gauge? Put them in the sim and let them get used, used to using that. The simulator technology gives us a, a way to really drop that cost of training 
I think, significantly, and we can produce a better product in the process. And that's why I'm so excited about what I'm seeing in all sectors, and that includes rotorcraft as well. It's not easy at all to develop a simulator that can hold a hover. It, it's, that is a complex, a lot of ones and zeros and a lot, of, a lot of smart thinking to try to figure out the programs to be able to do that. But when we're able to provide the rotorcraft community with good simulation, we're really going to help the safety levels and I think help pilot production too because we can lower cost. Pete, on the issue of uh, sequestration, if the President and Congress keep doing what they're doing and take us over the sequestration cliff, can you describe what the impact is going to be both on in terms of manufacturers and operationally for people who are out there flying and also what is the the economic impact going to be in terms of the mindset of the country, and what is that going to do to general aviation? Well, I think one of our, my board members mentioned yesterday just the fact that we have so much uncertainty out there is really hurting our industry. And if you look at, at traditionally where we start our recovery, um, it's we always have a lag time. So just that plain uncertainty of not knowing what's going to happen um, economically in this country and, and to some extent the rest of the world uh, becomes very important. But if you look specifically at the FAA, I know that um, when we went through this drill right before Christmas and sequestration was supposedly going, going to happen right after the first of the year, um, government officials weren't allowed to talk about what might happen. That's changed now because I think people are really saying this probably, unless something miraculous happens in the next few weeks, probably is going to happen. And now they've got to plan contingencies for it. If we start closing uh, because of furloughs and that of the whole workforce and we start closing towers, that has, a, that has an immediate impact on general aviation because the towers that, that might be closed will probably be more in our segment than they would be on the commercial side. Um, where we're specifically concerned about is furloughs in our certification workforce. If that happens, it's going to grind everything, just, just really have a negative impact. And that's, we have a lot of projects in the pipeline. And if that, if those folks are just not there to answer the phone or do the paperwork uh, that's required, it's going to hurt us. You know, the, the, the projects that we have in aviation are big, big expensive development programs. And so any uncertainty in how long it's going to take, if there's going to be an extension on your certification, are there going to be fewer resources, as Pete mentioned, to certify the products that people have already invested years and billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in developing, $50 million in developing, that's a big impact. So uh, time to market is very important, and obviously our products go to market after they're certified. We have time for one more question. Pete, what is your perception of the angle of attack indicator in Washington in regards to the rhetoric? And has the rhetoric been a factor in kind of the flat sails in some of the aircraft uh, types? And is, it, is your projection that it'll get a little better in regards to flying these important aircraft? It, it's very hard to put a, put a tag at this point in time on how many of our sales were impacted by the negative rhetoric. If you go back right after we had the debacle when the auto execs came to town and everything, we could, we could actually tag when customers walked away because of the rhetoric out there. But, but I think on a, on a bigger level, just the continually bringing up corporate jets, and we don't know if it's going to happen tonight, uh, is concerning just because it's so inconsistent with what we think the president and what everybody everybody here in the U.S. wants to see happen, and that's the economy improves. So if you, if you really care about jobs, you care about the people that make general aviation products. If you really care about exports, you look at that data that, that Brad presented, and half the market is outside the U.S. So you don't want to pillar the industry that's one of your bright spots in exports. And obviously, if, if you really value being able to travel around the planet or around this country, not only the lead dog, but the entire administration, the Congress, in business jets that just happen to be painted blue and white, then you don't pillar the industry that makes those airplanes. So, it, so the inconsistency just doesn't, doesn't follow in my mind. And we, we, it, this whole thing is about our depreciation schedule. And we have said time and again, Ed, Ed and I have mentioned this to many folks, if we're 
if we look as a country on overall depreciation of manufactured goods in total, and we go ahead and look at it, we'll be at the table, just like as we depreciate cars, computers, everything else. We have depreciation schedules to simulate manufacturing. But when you single out an industry and you have winners and losers, that's a bad thing. And that's why we have to punch back, because you, they shouldn't be singling us out. I think we need to wrap up. We encourage you to uh, grab Peter Brad afterward, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.